Threads is fetterizing. Yeah. I promise it means something. Don't fed on me. <laughs> that Feddy wops. Don't fed on me. <laughs> I do think the <clears throat> Threads app looks like the Don't Tread on Me snake logo. <laughs> kind of does. Doesn't the uh, the welcome screen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What is up, people of the internet? Welcome back to another festive episode of the Waveform Podcast. Another festive episode? Well, even more than last time. I think two people last time had uh, festive sweaters on. Yeah. I was out. I I didn't get the memo. Now I'm... Now it's three for three. Oh. So this is another even more festive episode than usual. It's good. It's great. Uh, Anyway, we're your hosts. I'm Marquez. I'm Andrew. And I'm David. This week, we've got uh, a bunch of stuff for you. Google is the subject of another lawsuit. Fun times. Thread is federating. I promise that means something. (laughs) And we've got the Smartphone Awards and the Blind Smartphone Camera Test recaps and some fun EV news. (laughs) Plenty to jump into. Plenty of places we could start. I feel like we could do the lawsuit stuff first. Well... First, first, Apple is halting Apple Watch Series Nine and Ultra Two sale. That's in a the lawsuit US this thing. Week. It is a lawsuit thing, but it's like a lot bigger of a deal in a lot of ways. So I read the headline and I, I kind of knew that there was some background lawsuit stuff brewing, but I didn't know it would actually get to the point where Apple would have to stop selling it in order to resolve this. Can yeah. you explain what happened and how it got to this point? Yeah. Okay. So a little bit of history. Um, long time ago. Apple reached out to this medical tech company called Massimo, and it wanted to collaborate with them about using their blood oxygen sensors, potentially in the Apple Watch, down the line. Um, but pretty soon after they had that initial call where they were like, yeah, we would love to like collaborate on your technology and it would be great. Apple started hiring all of their employees. They ended up hiring 30 of their employees, including their lead chief medical officer, and they offered, they were like, we'll double your salary and give you millions of dollars in Apple shares. So, you know, so, yeah. hard bargain. <laughs> yeah. so, yes. Hard bargain. Um, and then in 2019, Apple published patents for blood oxygen sensors in their watches under the name of one of the former employees, mm-hmm. which is a bad look. Yeah. Yeah. And it then, just seems so obvious. <laughs> yeah, it seems, it seems pretty obvious. Good trail. And then launched uh, the blo- blood oxygen sensor in the Apple Watch Series 6, which had the feature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In 2020, Massimo was like, this is a problem. Uh, so they sued Apple in federal district court for gaining ass- access to proprietary information by hiring those employees. Mm. And that lawsuit was taking way too long and it was not going anywhere and just kind of stalling in court. So in 2021, they filed a patent with uh, the international, not a patent, they filed a complaint with the International Trade Commission that tried to get, trying to get Apple to stop being able to sell the product, basically. That's how you go through if you're like, we need you to stop being able to import products and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So Massimo actually won that in January of this year, but nobody really thought much of it because Apple gets sued all the time. I want an exact example locally here at least one time, I think either Adam or Ellis brought it up. They were like at the end, we were done recording and we were like, is there anything else we want to talk about? It was me. It was you, right? And you were like, do we want to talk about Apple not being able to sell the Apple Watch because of this? And I like you all explicitly laughed. remembered saying, yeah. I don't think we should cover it. I, I just agreed. don't. I said, I don't see <laughs> Apple like getting punished at all. I don't see anything coming of this. Apple is too big. And yeah. here I am eating my words. Here, we're talking about I mean, it now. I mean, they get sued constantly, and there's always these headlines that just say, like, Apple might have to stop yeah. selling this if yeah. this company, you know, ABC. I think history was on my side in that assumption, but yeah. Ellis wanted to talk about this months yeah. ago. So I think the reason Ellis brought this up was because in October, the International Trade Commission issued an import ban on the Apple Watch Series 9 and Ultra 2, um, or, yeah, Ultra 2, right? Yep. The okay. newest Ultra, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was going to stop them from being able to import the watches into the country because their you know parts are made in all mm-hmm. the other countries and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is a 60-day presidential review period on International Trade Commission bans that allows the president of the United States to veto something like this. Famously, this happened with Apple before with the iPhone 4 because Samsung sued Apple for using uh, a cellular radio technology that it had a patent for, 
But Obama decided that that technology that was being used in the iPhone 4 was an essential technology for basically all cellular radios and all smartphones. Hmm. So it wouldn't make sense to ban that part because then Samsung would be the only phone company Mm -hmm. in existence. Hmm. So they vetoed that. But this one is much less likely to get that veto. Yeah, it's just the blood oxygen sensor technology right. of one of the features. And I mean, the history kind of like talks for itself that they reached out to them to work with them and then immediately after talking to them just poached all yeah, the employees. Yeah, the paper trails. And then yeah. filed the patent with the name of the employee. That they poached. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty so, straightforward. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the thing that's going to happen here, at least as of recording <laughs> Wednesday, <laughs> December 20th, you never know if this does not change, is that Apple has to halt the sales of the Series 9 and the Ultra 2 in the U.S. Uh, after 3 p.m. Th- Thursday, December 21st, which as of recording is tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it will have to stop making inventory available in the stores after <laughs> December 24th. So it has to stop online sales first. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. So if you're trying to get a Christmas gift and you were thinking about getting someone an Apple Watch... It just became a way better gift. Did you say though that it well, is um it can be still sold in like a Best Buy or something yes. like that? So do they have to have inventory already or can now they buy up inventory? Well, theoretically, mm-hmm. they can still be they can still buy inventory from Apple, except that Apple can't import more inventory after yeah. so December there's a, 24. There's a giant shipping container on its way here right now with <laughs> yeah. as many <laughs> Apple Watches possible. As possible. Yeah. yeah. Best Buy is yeah. buying as much stock <laughs> yeah. as they can afford. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, the order will ban imports of the devices after Christmas Day, which oh. Apple will be prohibited from selling to other app outlets okay. as well. Uh, it's a pretty big deal. I, I feel like people that get Apple gift cards for Christmas are going to be really disappointed. Mm. <laughs> uh, and apparently Apple has already started going to employees and, like, telling them about how this is working. And they're changing all the signage in their shops. So... They still have Apple Watch as signage, but it's just like the text and it shows the SE, but they're not like showing oh, the Ultra 2 in the Series 9. That's fascinating. Yeah. That is fascinating. I guess yeah. my like ultimate question here, I, I do, I saw something about how like Apple's trying to figure out ways around this and how yes. they can do it. Does Does everyone care about the blood oxygen that much that they can't just be like, screw it? No more blood That's oxygen. A good point. How often do you use that feature? You, like, or how accurate is it even really? Yeah. So I, I remember when it got announced and it was pretty cool. And you remember the David Blaine Ascension project yeah. where that was around the same time the feature got announced. He was like, should I use a dedicated blood oxygen monitor or should I use my Apple Watch? And I was like, mm. dude, use, use the dedicated <laughs> 10,000 <laughs> feet in the air. <laughs> you through the back of your wrist. There's no way yeah. it's that good. Just use the thing you have. But it was pretty interesting that you could just check on it. And 99% of the time you check on it, it's going to be 90-something percent because you're just walking yeah. around. Yeah. But if you're hiking or you're doing some high-altitude workout or something like that, then it may be a little lower. And it'll be interesting to see roughly what it is. But I don't I don't know that this is a thing that is essential to the Apple Watch. Yeah. I don't think it would be a disaster if it yeah. disappeared. It's one of those things like I, I don't want to come out here and be like, hey, Apple, just take away something you promised a lot of people because that sucks. That always sucks in that scenario. And they'll probably get sued by people for that. Yeah, but if Apple were to theoretically just disable it on every single watch and continue yeah. to sale, I think the amount of people that would notice that is like Very few. extremely yeah. minimal. Fair. And yeah. Yeah. It's kind of widely known that all of these sensors are not very accurate mm-hmm. on smartwatches, but what's important about these sensors is the trend data, right? Mm-hmm. If you have like a pretty stable VO2 max and then one day it drops significantly, that tells you something and it doesn't yeah. matter whether it's like 5% accurate or not. Yeah, we had a really good episode with Dr. Mike kind of like going over that like these things are all fun. There might be a little bit to it if you track trends and stuff like that, but ultimately, like, think of it as like entertainment that is helping your health. And I would probably argue that blood oxygen level is one of the least important yeah. out of a lot of them. Unless the it series... plummets. <laughs> yeah, unless it plummets. The Series yeah. 6 launched like right around COVID, though. So a lot of people were using it to f- try to figure out if they had COVID or not. Yeah, we won't be able to tell you. <laughs> that? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we need around a worldwide influenza is. Yeah. A watch making us more or less panicked yeah. about things. <laughs> the trend thing they said is, uh, you just reminded me of the, the temperature sensor. There's like a body temperature sensor now, which is literally just measuring the surface temperature of the skin on the back of your wrist, which is like not yeah. useful How is that at useful? all. Useful? <laughs> not, nine times out of ten, it doesn't even tell you the temperature, but it does tell you when you're sleeping the trend. I do think, uh, though, that is more important for women's health based on 
ovulation cycle. I think it's obvious. I don't. I'm not 100 sure because I, I am yeah, a man they, and I don't. But I do that's think that's where the temperature sensor. Yeah, they added it for, and, and they said there's a lot of benefits. That, that yeah. and sleep. But even so, they're not telling you the temperature. Mm, they're right. just telling you if it went up or down. Right. Which is because that's what's most important. Yeah, the trend so, data. The trend data. Yeah. So apparently, Apple is uh, rushing to issue a software update that basically like changes the algorithm on how it measures the blood oxygen in a way that they think the International Trade Commission will find, find different. different enough. Mm -hmm. um, but Massimo is sticking to their guns and says that it will, would require a hardware change. So it's going to be dependent on what the International Trade Commission mm -hmm. says. If it requires a hardware change, like especially because this is all health data, Apple needs to get all this stuff like approved and like do a, multiple rounds of testing. Yeah. So it's not going to be easy to just switch out a piece of hardware and then just start shipping them again. If they actually cannot start selling these, they're probably just going to nix the Ultra 2 and the Series 9 until the next generation. Do you know if they just Which would disable crazy. functionality of the hardware, would they still not be able to sell it because the hardware is there? Like if theoretically they did what I said and just said like there is no more of this, it's not even using that sensor. That I'm sensor is just sure. a spare part now. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure because I don't even think that that's something they could do without like updating your Apple Watch software. Which would like, they count that as a as a fix? a fix? I don't know. It's like people it's are probably supposed to do it. Depends on how the lawsuit mm. is written. Yeah, I, which yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that would be kind of like easy. It seems like if they're going to halt sales, then it's not something that they can do. If they have to literally halt sales where all they, if, if all they yeah. had to do was push us off, if they just had to air power it sensor, and just never talk yeah. about it again. Yeah. Yes. Then I think they would do that immediately. But right. Exactly. I will say for Apple, if this, of this happening, it is the best time for it to happen because they probably have all of their Q4 sales before Christmas already. So like this is stopping at Christmas, which is Notably, the time where most people are like, "Okay, I spent enough. I'm gonna like chill for a couple." Oh, I months. feel like a lot of people are gonna get like Apple gift cards for Actually, Christmas. That's a good point. And New Year generally means people starting to take their health a little more seriously. Yeah. So Apple, oh, okay, gosh. maybe I'm wrong. Maybe was, I'm the exact opposite. Well, so Apple's wearables business made 13.48 billion dollars in the Q1 2023 holiday quarter. Uh, and that's going to get nixed pretty significantly if they start. Is this just yeah. Apple Watch Ultra 2 and Series 9? Yes. yes. So they could sell Series 8 and Ultra 1? They will currently the sell refurbished uh, Series 8s on their website, but they will not be able to sell those if this goes into effect. So it's all the way back and to they the can beginning sell of this sensor in Series 6? Yeah, but they don't sell Series 6 or Series 7 anymore. So they sell Series 8 and Series 9. They'll yeah. just halt both of those. Yeah. And, and I assume the, the first and second Apple Watch Ultra have that. Blood oxygen. Sensor. Theoretically, but I don't think they sell them. Ultra Watch One? Yeah, I don't think no. they sell Ultra Ones. And the SE yeah. does not have it, right? The SE doesn't have it. So they it. can still sell the SE. Yeah, they can still sell the SE. Wow. So Can I ask a stupid question? Sure. It's probably not stupid. <laughs> I think it is. Um <laughs> we just said wearables. Is that only watches or are like AirPods I'm included not in that? Totally because sure. I don't the when I I guess I'm thinking too much accessories and like a wearable is a smart device acting as something that was previously something oh, you, you wear. In the like in thing? the like when it says like Apple's wearables include this much in sales. AirPods are not included in that, right? I believe that's just and watches. AirPod is the only wearable or the sorry, watch is the only wearable thing. Yeah. I think that's right. I think I Even though technically you question. are wearing the headphones, I think yeah, that's not yeah, a wearable. Yeah. 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 I think like it's replicating a watch where air headphones are just headphones. They're yeah. not something you wear without them doing what they're supposed to. Right. Okay. So yeah, Sorry. apparently this this like holiday quarter is the biggest quarter for the wearables division. Um, in the third quarter of this year, they made a little over $8 billion, but the first quarter of la of this year, they made almost $14 billion. So that's almost oh, double because of the quarter. holiday quarter. God, so yeah. Dollars, man. Th this goes a little bit deeper because uh, Apple is countersuing Massimo because they came out with a smartwatch like right after the Apple Watch Series 6 came out that kind of looks like an Apple Watch and, <laughs> uh, and uses all the same sensors. Nice. Um, I don't think it looks enough like an Apple Watch for their... Yeah, it's that one right there. This I one? don't think it looks enough like an Apple Watch for their lawsuit to go through. Uh, it just kind of looks like a general fitness I mean, tracker. Yeah, this honest. looks like every Amazon... It's $600, I guess, because it's by a it's also actual FDA health. approved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like FDA cleared. That so. actually makes way more sense. Speaking but. of FDA approval, this is totally off topic, but <laughs> remember how Google was going to put a temperature sensor for your skin? And they were like, <laughs> the phone. trust me, that'll be later. Just measure pots and pans for now. 
It's still not there. Yeah. The temperature I, sensor still just does stuff. You know what I need to do? We need to do a long form episode about is like investigating why the temperature sensor exists on the Pixel 8 Pro. I have like a, a feeling you're going to reach. Story. <laughs> yeah. It's probably because yeah. somebody thought it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And then it started working on it. And they were like, oh, we also in the background got to get FDA approval. And then they started working on that. And then it came up to time to launch the phone. And the FDA was like, oh, oh, you wanted us to work yeah. on that? And then they're still working on it while they have to ship this feature and explain why it's there. I so think someone to... came up with it during COVID and would, was like, oh, this would be great because you can tra- track your. Yeah, but that's. That's Google timing, you know? Really? I mean, oh, I mean that's timing for like a lot of things. A lot of We're, companies. Yeah. yeah, a lot of companies. But Google famously needs to get 20 layers of approval before they can do anything. So Fair. so in 2020, somebody was like, it'll be a good idea. And then in 2023, they were like, it's time to launch. Did you get FDA <laughs> approval? And they were like, oh, no. no. Oh, right. <laughs> it's not here. <laughs> Trust me, it'll be there soon. Yeah. Brutal. So, yeah, we'll see how this goes. But, I mean, this is actually like probably one of the biggest yeah, it hits is. to Apple in a very long I'm time. I'm super surprised it happened. Yeah. And, man, maybe some of these companies aren't as completely untouchable as we thought. Yeah. Well, speaking of giant hits to companies we didn't think would get them, (laughs) Google (laughs) to pay $700 million (laughs) to settle the anti-competitive Play Store lawsuit. lawsuit. Yeah. So this is another lawsuit that Google lost. (laughs) This is not the Epic one. Not the Epic one. This is a different anti-competitive Google Play Store The Epic one that they just lost, we don't even know yet what the repercussions are going Mm -hmm. to be. That's going to be decided in January. Uh, But this one, they got sued by all 50 states' attorneys general over its illegal monopoly with the Play Store, which is basically exactly what the Epic lawsuit was about. To get all 50 states to agree to something is wild. wild. That's amazing. (laughs) I was like, wow. You got Texas and New Hampshire uh, to agree. Wow. Big tech is pretty much the only thing that both sides Mm -hmm. of the aisle will agree on. That's fair. I think that's super fair. Yeah. So... This is a very, very long lawsuit document. Um, The Verge had a really, really great recap of all the important things that are actually going to happen because of this lawsuit. So I'm quoting them like fairly directly here. Uh, Okay, this is a long list. (laughs) So they have to pay $700 million. Um, Apparently that is roughly 21 days of Google's operating profit from the Play Store alone. That's actually not that much. 721 days? So Mm -hmm. like less than a month of profit? I think Marquez yeah. is saying that's not that much of like their total profit. Oh no! But it is—it's just a lot of money. wild that they make seven hundred <laughs> yeah. million dollars in oh, less yeah, than in a twenty-one month. Days. Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. That's a <laughs> ton that's like, of money. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and it, yeah. wherever they're paying it to, that's a ton of money. Right. But it's only twenty-one days 20, of not even a revenue part. profit. Yeah, yeah, twenty-one days of profit. Oh. Well, it says operating. Pro- oh, yeah, operating profit. That means they paid all their operating <laughs> expenses, and they have that left over in 21 days. That's insane. That's <laughs> that's insane. that's like nothing. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Okay. Wow. So, 629 million of that 700 million is going to go to consumers who may have overpaid for apps or in-app purchases via Google Play after taxes, lawyers' fees, and so on. Whoa. I. I'm I wondering, I'm yeah, I'm wondering if like everyone that's paid for anything in Google Play will just get like a refund of some sort. Or what differentiates overpaying versus yeah. not overpaying? Are we right. like, what is that? Is it like they might get like a 30% refund? Yeah, are we saying all apps are overpaid because of the 30% tax? The 30%? I, yeah. yeah. Or are they talking about just, I don't think they're talking about the Google tax here. They're right. talking about like actual taxes, but. Yeah, but it says, oh, what does like, that mean? Yeah. Overpaid for apps or in app purchases, which is in this going to be like, you have to fill out a form and be like, yeah, I did overpay for this app. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's going to work. I don't know. I would wager that it has way more to do with in app purchases. Mm. Just because like the, that feels like the thing that something would go wrong with yeah. more so than just like $2 for an app you pay one time. Yeah. In. Uh, 70 million will go to the state's attorneys, attorneys general to see, to use how they see fit, which is super yacht. strange. Yeah. <laughs> why, why are the, I don't know. What why are mean? the attorneys general getting paid for that? I don't really know. Okay. I don't, maybe they're going to use it to like implement law or something. In I guess they states. did spend their hard earned time bringing this lawsuit from all 50 states to the. Screen. No, I, I don't think they keep it as profit. I don't think they keep it as no, profit. They, they allocate it to various allocate government. It. Programs oh, that are, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, okay. gonna the super yacht program, <laughs> <laughs> the All North Dakota days. super yacht program. Yeah, yeah. so it's like one point four million per attorneys general, which is kind of a lot. Um, and then one million dollars will go to the uh, settlement administration, which basically just means like paying for lawyer fees 
Yeah. Uh, for seven years, Google will continue to technically enable Android to allow the installation of third-party apps on mobile devices through means other than Google Play, which they have already done. Seven so years. that doesn't really do anything. They've already been doing that. Like they allowed you to sideload. You can sideload an APK. Yeah. Is yeah. Is it that they can't? Um, I thought I saw something a couple weeks ago about how the warning when you sideload that is going to come up. Okay. Later. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. Uh, for five years, Google will allow developers to offer alternative in-app billing system next to Google Play. Why is it only for a limited time? I don't know. So they can sue them for $700 million again? <laughs> again. <laughs> it seems like it, but okay. Yeah. So, okay, five years, let yeah. them use alternative in-app billing. Cool. So now, basically, if you're if you're paying for something in Google Play, instead of having uh, checkout with Google be, like, the only way you can pay, yeah. they'll be, like, pay us directly with PayPal or something like that. Get your V-Bucks straight from Fortnite. Right. Sick. Uh, for five years, Google won't make developers offer their best prices to consumers who pick Google Play and Google Play billing, which I didn't know was a thing is in, is kind of insane. Offering your best. It basically means you can only, if you're going to sell this app on like any app store, you have to have the best price you have it available anywhere on Google Play. Oh, which is pretty aggressive. That and Amazon has done that too. That is, is that sounds similar. Sorry, I interrupted. No, go, a no, bit go for it. Remember when Apple and Epic were doing that, where the way Epic did around it was like, if you buy skins in the Apple Store, it's 30%. we are tacking on the thirty percent thing. Where if you buy it online or on Xbox or right. whatever, so it's less. The so they're trying to make it so companies can't be less money on their website. I think it it sounds weird because it's like, what if it goes on sale? Then does it have to? On sale, I think it's trying, it's preventing a circumvention. Well, yeah, Amazon had done this thing. I read this story about how some small retailer that was like hand making things had like a holiday sale on their website, but Amazon basically threatened to take them off of Amazon because they weren't allowed to have the holiday sale on the website, but not on Amazon. Wow. Yeah. This reminds, have any of you guys watched Nathan for you? Yeah. Did you see the one where he does the like, it's like a small TV store and it's like if you can beat uh, it's like if you can beat the price of a TV, you can use some coupon. And so like people come in to get this coupon for a dollar TV, but it's in this back room with like an alligator in front of it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we can skip that. <laughs> okay. uh, f- let's see. For four years, Google won't make developers ship titles on Google Play at the same time as other stores and with feature parity. So they basically said if you launch on Google Play, you have to come out when they come out on other stores. And they're not allowed to do that anymore. And they're not allowed to and do that. And they have the exact same version everywhere. Yeah. This, now for four years. Yeah. This is very weird. Mix it up. I agree with Marquez that it's like X amount of years when it, it feels like they should just be doing this forever. And all of, a all lot of them are different, are different yeah. years. <laughs> Seven, <laughs> five, five, four. Well, yeah. we'll do that four years for that. This one. one's not quite as bad as the other one. Yeah. So you can do that again in three years. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> For five years, Google won't make companies exclusively put Google Play on the phone or its home screen. So that's a big deal because I, I believe Samsung phones used to ship oh. with Galaxy Store on the home screen, and now they're not allowed to. Mm-hmm. Like, if you use Google Play, or you have to have Google Play to be the only app store on the on your home screen. Oh, it was the, it made it be the only app store on yeah. the home screen? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, that sounds bad. That sounds bad. <laughs> that that 100% feels anti-competitive. Yeah, for sure. It's so minor, but it does. Yeah. For four years, Google won't stop OEMs from granting installer rights to preloaded apps. Um, not sure what that means, 100%. Me neither. Yeah. I won't stop OEMs from... I'm wondering if there were some other companies trying to be a preloaded app and oh. Google didn't want it as a competitive nature and... It says installer to, rights, though. So, like, a preloaded app could be the the Samsung App Store, right? Yeah. So, installer rights being like the right to install, install apps. apps through that pl- App Store. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. So, Google won't stop stop Samsung. others. That's yeah. That's, that's weird. Strange. Strange. Yeah, I'm a little. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. I feel like I get the gist of it, but can't set an example or. Yeah. These are all kind right. of along the same theme, which yeah. is you can't be the overly anti competitive only yeah. app store available or visible. Yeah. It's like focus on your own sh- not other people's sh- Yeah. Yeah. And that and makes perfect sense. Let the competition <laughs> yeah. decide yeah. who decides what to use. Right. Uh, for five years, Google won't require its consent before an OEM preloads a third party app store. Wow. Which is just ridiculous. Uh, for four years, Google will let third-party app stores update apps without requiring user approval, which it's crazy that they didn't allow that before. For four years, Google will 
let sideloaded app stores use its APIs and feature splits to help install apps. So I guess that means that the Google Play Store has like special APIs mm -hmm. that only it can access through Android. Uh, for five years, Google will Google will turn its two sideloading scare screens. This is what you were talking okay, about okay, before. Yeah. Scare screen. Into a single user prompt, which will read the equivalent of this agreed upon language. Your phone currently isn't configured to install apps from this source. Granting this source permi permission to install apps could place your phone and data at risk. It still seems... That's it's just one it's versus two. It's yeah. part of this is so funny to me because I know there's so many people who are less tech savvy that would see that and totally freak out. Yeah, and then are the same people. Who, I guess that makes sense. They're the same people who get scammed by the fake website that says like we have all. Of oh, hundred percent. Yeah. But that's that's super scary. I agree. Yeah, I I I think that Google kind of has a, a right to its users and a, a they should show screens that say like just so you yeah. know this is not we can't control this so whatever happens to your phone is like not controlled not by and us. it's 100 like a legality thing like they yeah. they're covering their own but at the same time them covering themselves there is also beneficial to them right. because it's going to push more people and this towards. is always apple's argument too is like if we can't yes. control the pipeline then we can't make sure that our devices are secure for our users what i ultimately yeah see here maybe we can talk about it as the end is like when all this goes through i'm very interested to see like are things going to crash and burn like they've made it seem like it's <laughs> yeah. going to happen or is everything going to be fine and we're going to be like wow we got scared out of this for yeah. a long time because some of those arguments are totally reasonable yeah but you can also tell are even more beneficial to the bottom line of google and apple yeah making money off right of it. right for five years, Google will let user choice billing participating developers let their users know about better pricing elsewhere and complete transactions using the developer's existing web-based billing solution in an embedded web view within the app. Uh, this basically just means that you're allowed to say, hey, if you buy through us directly, then it's cheaper and you can purchase through that directly. So That feels like a tack on to the one we talked about before mm -hmm. of allowing prices being different. Right. For six years, Google will continue to allow developers to use contact information obtained outside of outside the app or in app with user consent to communicate with users out of app. Um, vague. Contact information obtained outside or that that I don't. I don't fully know. I don't understand. fully understand that one. Maybe it's like you can't only google is not the only one that's going to autofill your contact information like you're able to do i guess it. if you can do inside the app then they inside the app itself like email phone number ad oh. right i don't know <laughs> for six years google will let consumption only apps like netflix which doesn't let you pay on device tell users about better prices elsewhere without linking to an app outside website example this is available on our website for 9.99 yeah this is a big one yeah, these are the. This is the. I think the the last two here are the the ones that actually matter the most <laughs> because that would be pretty classic. Netflix would really, really want you to sign up for Netflix on Netflix dot com or in the Netflix. It's the only way somewhere. they allow it right now. Yeah, because if you signed up through a different service like the Play Store, they would require you to have the same price because that's one of their rules, and then they would take thirty percent of that. So instead of offering it for a higher price to still make the same amount. They would just go, never mind, you can't sign up in the Netflix app. At least now they're going to be able for six years <laughs> to tell you that you can sign up online. Yeah. And on top of that, for consumption-based stuff like this is generally subscription. So this is not 30% of $9.99. This is 30% of $9.99 every month mm -hmm. for years most people yeah. have. Mm -hmm. um, this also the, sorry. It's a good, uh, most people sign up through their phone anyway because, yeah. so yeah. a lot of people are probably overpaying for stuff and not realizing but it. What, what's interesting about this is this feels similar to two steps above here that says are allowed to complete transactions using existing web-based billing solution, similar to that, but also embed it inside the app, except that's only for the next five years and for the next six years. <laughs> They can you can do that, but I guess not embedded in a website inside yeah, the app. Yeah, just tell people it's somewhere <laughs> Just else. tell them. Yeah. Go to the website, please. Go to the website. Just pop-ups. Yeah, and specifically it says like that you can say what price it is okay. through their website. Because before Netflix just said you can't sign up for Netflix through this app. But now you can say you can't sign up for Netflix through this app. Please do it on the website. Also, it's cheaper on the website. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and then last one, promise. <laughs> For six years, Google shall not prohibit developers from disclosing to users any service or other fees associated with the Google Play or Google Play's billing system. So for six years, they're going to be like, hey, guess what? There's a 30% cut. That's why it costs so much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Help help me, small developer, <laughs> come <laughs> by on website. Yeah. Google's taking all my money. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm making fun of that, but like that is a totally reasonable thing. If I found a small app, like, of course I'm going to pick Apollo, which is an iPhone app, which makes no sense. But like, I would want to support <laughs> like, like yeah. I, stuff like that. I want to support the people that I know are right. smaller. And that actually would change me from going a bit out of my way to pay yeah. for that outside of the Google store being like, oh, I, I would like to support yeah. this person. So I actually think that's really big. For sure. I think a lot of this stuff kind of wrapped up kind of just shows that Google works very, very hard <laughs> to keep people in their Play Store ecosystem because it makes them so much money. Yeah. And this kind of shows how far they'll go, like mm -hmm. not allowing developers to say specific things, needing to launch at the exact same time as every other platform if they launch on Google Play at all. Like they really kind of have control of the way that you launch apps. Yeah. Like a lot of control. Yeah. I mean, this is not even everything, right? This is yeah. just like the big kind of things. And man, right. I knew it was like 30% and some stuff, but this almost feels like they're uh, like an extra chairman on the board of every single app that's in the store and telling them exactly what they can yeah. and can't do. They were able to do so many of these things because what was the alternative? Going, mm, I guess we won't have the Play Store on our phone. It's like, no, you... You have you need that yeah. on your phone or your yeah. phone won't sell. Well, but, so yeah, they're able to pull those levers. And it goes outside of it too because a lot of this stuff is based on side loading when it's like, right. danger, danger. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to do that. Come pay my 30% fee that they're not allowed to tell you we're taking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think theoretically what the government wants to see is just that Google is open to having like choice. <laughs> so, so Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and theoretically, the best option would be people still use the Play Store because it's the best place to buy apps. It has lower prices because Google takes less of a cut. It has better features, whereas like third party app developers and app stores could exist. But if Google actually wants to make all the money, they need to be the best product, whereas right now they're just not allowing other products. Uh, yeah, I think that. And I think ultimately, if you look at the number, Google is going to lose a ton of money in a number. But if you look at percent of profit lost, I think it's going to be super minimal because yeah. the Play Store is the easier way of doing a lot of this. But and most people are going to do that because not everyone's tech savvy and right. that's the easiest way of doing it. So like this isn't going to make that much of a difference. But right. It, the choice is better. People like using defaults and like unless you're Samsung, you probably don't want to host your own app store anyway, mm -hmm. you know. So Oppo hosts their own app store and like some some c companies yeah. do, but it's a lot of infrastructure to host it's your the own big app ones. store. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, lawsuit trivia is uh, is over. <laughs> now, you know. Now, you know, <laughs> now, you know, you got all that right. Everyone <laughs> yeah, out there yeah. driving right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is a lot of information. Hopefully you got all that. We got to take a quick break. But when we come back, we got a bunch more stuff to talk about, including the smartphone awards. So before we take that break. Trivia. What timing. <laughs> Always on the ball over there. Beautiful. So, you thought you were done with lawsuit trivia. <laughs> oh. Guess again. Oh. As part <laughs> of all of The Verge's awesome coverage of this Google lawsuit, Chaim Gartenberg covered a secret Google program that was intended to butter up and keep developers in the Play Store. Do any of you know what this program was called? It was a secret. Well, not yeah, anymore because that's yes, I do it. know what that was called. Uh, and I will accept either the official Google title or the name that Google informally referred to it as in private communications. And David, if you potentially know both from researching this story, maybe I'll give you two points. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa I just want to say I'm upset there's no multiple choice because I just want Ellis to make up a bunch of names <laughs> oh, like, don't worry. Of, of company or like projects that are buttering up <laughs> uh, developers Project butter. to try. Project yeah. Butter. Project, Project butter. butter. Project Crisco. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe I will. Maybe that's what I'll do later. Anyway, after the break. This episode is supported by Wix. Web agencies, you're gonna like this one. Let me tell you about Wix Studio, the platform that gives agencies total creative freedom to deliver complex client sites while still smashing deadlines. How? 
First of all, let's talk about the advanced design capability. So with Wix Studio, you can build unique layouts with a revolutionary grid experience and watch as elements scale proportionally by default. No code animations add sparks of delight, while custom CSS gives total design control, but it doesn't stop there. Bring ambitious client projects to life in any industry with a fully integrated suite of business solutions from e-com to events, bookings, and more, and extend the capabilities even further with hundreds of APIs and integrations. You know what else? The workflows just make sense. There's the built-in AI tools, the centralized workspace, the on-canvas collaborating, the reuse of assets across sites, the seamless client handover, and that's not all. Find out more at wix.com studio. Support for Waveform comes from NetSuite. So your business is humming along right now, everything is going as planned, and then things slow down. Your team gets buried with manual labor and things that used to take a day are now taking a week. If that sounds like you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, one. So 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. It's the number one cloud financial system helping you streamline your company's accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25 it is NetSuite's 25th birthday this year. So that's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And one, because your business is one of a kind. So NetSuite makes sure you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risks, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash waveform. That's netsuite.com slash waveform to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash waveform. Welcome back. Threads officially started testing Federation through ActivityPub. Those are words that mean things, I promise. Uh, it's a little complex. Effectively, what this means is that there is this idea of the decentralized internet where you can post on any platform and it shows up on other platforms and people can like and comment and not subscribe, but they can like and comment, they can do all this stuff. And all of this activity through ActivityPub mm -hmm. will show up on whatever platform that you're using. Uh, surprisingly, Mark Zuckerberg and Meta are pro the Fediverse, pro ActivityPub, which... I'm not sure if that's real or if they're just trying to do that yeah. to make it seem like they're more open and more for the open web. Uh, but this is a pretty big deal because as of now, they are testing it with some big accounts on Instagram threads. So Adam Mar Mar what is Masseri. His Masseri. Masseri. Yeah, he's one of the first people that is fediverse through ActivityPub. So mm. you can actually see his threads posts on Mastodon right now. Oh. Yeah. And so uh, there are other apps that are federating through ActivityPub, like Flipboard is now federating, so you should be able to see Flipboard comments and posts right. on Mastodon. So it's this inter interoperability, interplay of like the same content and engagement working across different clients and different sites. Right. It's inter-networking. <laughs> Here we go yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some thoughts. Okay. I mean, my thoughts have always been like a little high level, like zoomed out. I'll, I'll give two. Mm -hmm. One is, look, I've always been a fan of of, of cheeses, of of Jack cheese and, and cheddar and all these others. But I just can't get behind Feta having its own universe. Oh. Damn. I'm the dad. I, I really wasn't <laughs> expecting that. Okay. So okay. Here, Marquez. Okay, <laughs> like, my shoes. Way so out of left field. Like, uh, that's, so that's one. That's a David joke, and you just <laughs> you just went for it. I was so interested <laughs> in the analogy. I thought I was finally going to understand activity pub nope, based not, on cheeses. But, but okay, but number two, though, seriously, I, I've always felt like one of the biggest skills of navigating the internet or being a creator on the internet is creating different things for different places mm. and sort of being able to natively speak the language of different platforms. So if I'm on Instagram there is a way that you can do Instagram right. that is inherently different from the way that you do Twitter and the way that you do threads. So if you give me the ability to log into one client and post the same thing everywhere, I don't think that's better for me. Hmm. Can, can I potentially answer this and you can yeah. tell me how wrong I am? Sure. sure. It seems like the majority of these things linking together are still similar content wise like mastodon 
threads and stuff are more like these like singular posts. So like anything you would post on Twitter seems that it is not necessarily connecting right. Instagram into this, right? Yet. Or YouTube yet. We okay. could have our 4chan posts on LinkedIn. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, <laughs> nightmare blunt rotation of social media. I think as a, it's just, I look at it from the creator's perspective. I think the other end of that coin is when you do post in these different universes, the Instagram universe, the Threads universe, the Mastodon universe, you don't own your audience as you move between each of these different places. Right. So if I post yeah. and, I, and I'm going to abide by the rules of and I am posting in the native language of Mastodon and I suddenly go, you know what? I would like to take my audience over here to threads. It is when they're separate, very difficult. And when they are connected, they feel like you already own your audience and they can you can just move them from place to place and they can move and they can use whatever place they want. They can be a threads person. They can be a Mastodon person. They'll still be subscribed to you. So that's the the, the bright side of that. Claim. I think it is in your sense for creators and influencers potentially a negative in that way. But I would argue 99 percent of the people using it are like people following you would rather be like, I want to choose the platform in which I can follow you. Mm -hmm. And that's more user base than the people who are more worried about like, where are all my followers yeah. splitting off into? I guess I wonder how much of people's decision to use each of these platforms is based on the people there or the platform itself. Like when I go to Instagram, I'm there right. for Instagram stuff. And when I go to yeah, Twitter. I agree with that totally. Yeah. Like, I do think there's a totally different version, like how you post on Instagram versus Twitter. I mm -hmm. mean, Instagram is where Travis Kelsey can post winning a Super Bowl. Twitter is where he can post about a squirrel eating bread. <laughs> um, sure. They're like totally different things. But like, right. I think in the sense of if people want to follow your Twitter, I don't want to call it persona, but your the type of content you're doing on Twitter. Mm -hmm then somebody might be like, well, I like the layout of Mastodon better, but I still want to follow Marquez, even though right. he likes posting from Twitter. Right. So then, am I right in that? It's, yeah. it's more like the users and the followers sounds like such a stupid term, but like but the people keeping for. up, yeah, giving them, it's like, am I going to watch hockey on a Samsung? If hockey was only on Samsung TVs, do I want to be able to get the choice of watching it on an LG TV instead? Right, sure. It also, you yeah. know, it leads to like a world where like, and this is all hypotheticals, right? But like Mark has you review cars. So let's say like the guy hypothetically who owns your favorite social network also owns an electric car company <laughs> that you gave like an unfavorable review. And then he's like, wait, I don't want you on my social network anymore. You can still reach all the same followers mm -hmm. who are on sites not controlled by this hypothetical right. person. Yeah. Theoretically, this actually feeds into what we were talking about with a lot of uh, competition, because in the previous landscape where all of these companies could make Twitter apps, Twitter clients like Falcon and all these Twitter apps Good that times. we used to be able to use Got before the API those. tokens disappeared, um, that was sort of like everyone's making it an app because they have an open API, but it's all feeding into this one server base that Twitter operates. And Twitter makes the rules and Twitter makes the features and controls it. Exactly. Yeah. So now it's like, you, you don't have, like right now, if you want to make a social networking company, it's probably the hardest thing you can possibly do because you have to gain a social graph, which mm -hmm. is why Instagram threads was like the easiest one to do because you just onloaded everyone from Instagram. And which is why buying one of the most popular social media platforms and renaming it was kind of a dumb move yeah yeah but that's why like t2 didn't work because they weren't able to get enough people on it that's yeah. why uh blue sky is having trouble because they're having trouble getting people on it mm -hmm. but theoretically if you just had this protocol you could make a social networking app and you already have everybody on it yeah you yeah. already have all the content so if it's just an app that has different features or a different layout or you wanted to have an API that like, or not an API, if you wanted to have a feature that only showed you um, hiking threads or yeah. hiking posts, you know, it automatically uses AI to like only show you hiking stuff or only show you this, yeah. then you can, you can have a lot more competition because you can just build an app and plug it directly into the Fediverse and you don't have to build your own social graph. It just already exists. I'm cool with that. I think that's a it's a great idea because I'm gonna inevitably want to use certain apps, but with different features of a. It's like having third party clients again, like that. I love that world. Right. I would have used third party clients for everything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the the hypothetical like fast forward into the future where every single social media company is plugged into the Fediverse, and I just post one thing, and it's 
my LinkedIn and my Instagram <laughs> and my Twitter. Like, I don't like yeah. that. Wolf, yeah. 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 Th- there was that meme that was going around uh, a couple of years ago that was like, me on LinkedIn, me on... Um... Oh, yeah. oh, I posted... I did one of those. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was always like, like, me on LinkedIn, me on Tinder, me on, yeah. me on Instagram, Twitter. Instagram. Yeah. Or... And it yeah. was like completely different personas. And there's a reason it's different. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's why, <laughs> yeah. that's why it's so hard to have like new social media apps is because, yeah, we are in the age of like mature social media. Like all the ideas have been taken like Mm -hmm. tiktok came along and it was like oh that's actually new and different here comes 20 billion people yeah like short form vertical all right we're doing it it's going to be genuinely really hard to come up with a new one because Mm -hmm. we have all these great ideas already but also there's there's like a reason why i post some things on one place and some things on the other place yeah you could probably still do that there are probably settings you could probably easily set up settings to say like i don't want posts that I make on this app to show up on other apps in the Fediverse, yeah, that makes sense. or like okay. that I don't want to see other people's posts from other apps. You could probably do that too. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just You're... like that's sorry that my my yeah. number one like sign of a talented content creator is they're able to speak the language yeah. of a native platform. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think to go on to a question I have in terms of people who are content creators using social media and what this could entail. Uh, this might be another dumb question, but I know nothing <laughs> about Activity Pub. Let's, let's, let's say you post something on Twitter and somebody follows you, or uh, on threads because it is going to get linked, but somebody who uses Mastodon follows you. Would you see numbers reflected on the app that maybe Marquez posts from? I actually don't know. I believe so. My like, I would kind of assume so, but I just keep thinking about how... M- I don't know how marketing agencies are still so bad at working with creators and understanding engagement and metrics that now we're going to add potentially dozens of different oh. platforms <laughs> that can connect to one thing. Like they're just not going to have any idea how to like gauge an audience yeah. of a content creator. It's, instead of being, we would like one Instagram and one Twitter, they're just like, we would like one post. <laughs> right. Just the post. One, the because post it goes that goes to up. all your people. I mean, but also, how many people are following you? How many people interact? If it's on different websites, does it leak into amount. all other ones? This is just proof that I have no idea what Activity Pub is. No, I think that's a fair question. That's like, how fair. if there are unlimited, if the, if it's truly open and anyone can build anything that plugs in, and they're not all tracked across everything, a thousand people but, follow you. For or one. are they tracked across? Yeah. Everything. Why wouldn't they be attracted? Uh, uh, well, it may that's why be, I said it's it like, be. how will I know from my point of view, let's say I'm a creator who posts something. How do I know from this post that I just put out into the world, how many people total are engaging with it and from where? I okay. guess that's my question is, would it, if you posted on threads and I replied on Mastodon, it would still be in the yeah. thread replies, right? So yeah. I just looked this up. Um, Adam Asari on threads and on Mastodon has the same amount of followers. 658,000 okay. followers. And if you so like everything. click on that first post, is it the same replies on both? Uh, let's should see. Be. Yeah, it should be. It's so got it 14 replies on Mastodon. And there's like 300 And it's replies. got 138 oh, yeah. replies. So, I mean, they haven't built it out completely yet. Okay. They said they're like adding features and working through it. And they said it's going to take uh, upwards of a year to actually get okay. the full functionality built out. So theoretically, everything could when it's built out get synced across everything all of the comments are supposed to get synced all the likes are supposed to get synced but i think right now all that's happening is the posts get like cross posted but they will they will eventually all be integrating that makes so the fact that they have the same amount of follower he has the same amount of followers on both platforms is actually i think good because i think that a lot of influencers will actually like push their numbers up a ton because they'll go to someone who wants to make a like do a YouTube ad and they have no followers on YouTube, but they have a ton on Instagram. And they'll say, I have 800 million followers across all my platforms, but that's all Instagram, but they can tell someone who wants to make a YouTube thing that they have mm-hmm. a lot of followers. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's easier to track if you can just say, these are all of the people that follow me. Because the problem too, is that like a lot of people follow me on YouTube and Instagram. And I can't just say, I have double the total followers because yeah, oh you can so and people do. people do people do oh this yeah is the problem though <laughs> people do all the time and that is such a fake number yeah. <laughs> there's so much overlap yeah whereas um, if there's just one universal number and you say I have one million people that follow me total at all across all platforms yeah which is like so that's great because yeah. it's for you you're able to have a big number but if I am the advertiser now think about it I want specifically the people who look at the images you post yeah. I don't have a video I want you to post an image well it's like oh, okay 95% of those people are just there for the videos 
not see what I mean? Like, you, but you, you could probably have statistics it. for each site, right? You could say like Instagram, I have these people are engaging with this information. Like Instagram will probably give you statistics of like the people that engage on Instagram. Yeah, there's gonna have to be some amazing Fediverse local statistics analytics <laughs> hub. Yeah, somewhere. It doesn't matter because marketing agencies are still 20 years behind yeah. understanding any of <laughs> this, true. so they have no idea what's going yeah. on. So there's gonna be a lot of interesting somehow. like local versus global analytics that's gonna happen. Yeah. So on that cottage cheese verse or something. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> something else. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully that happens pretty soon. But it's good to see it finally start happening because when they launched Threads, they said that it was going to be federated, and everyone got really excited. It's been quite a while since they launched Threads, and now that they're actually starting to work on it. It they're actually following through with this promise, which feels really good. Yeah, I wish Adam was here too, not Missouri. Adam Molina. Oh, yeah. Because he would have been yeah, really he's like about the guy. this. What? Yeah. He's the he's the he's, he's the, the guy. Activity pub guy. Yeah. Yeah. Adam is very into activity pub, so it's a bummer that he's sick today. Mm. But everyone wish Adam well. F in the chat. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is what we want. We do want F in the chat. I feel chat. like F's is like to pay respect. They died, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he he oh, Adam yeah, is alive and well. He just doesn't want to get us sick. But are you saying he deserves disrespect? No. No. <laughs> never. I would never disrespect Adam in any way, shape, or form. That's so true. F's in the chat, guys. That's true. Adam Mazzari, on the other hand. Hey. <laughs> Instagram for iPad. Come on. You can Fediverse, but you can't Instagram on iPad. <laughs> so real. Very just so kidding. Real. I actually think he's pretty awesome. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Okay. All right, let's, let's talk smartphone awards. Let's talk that. Yeah. Spoiler, we're going to talk about the winners. If somehow you are listening to the podcast before the video, thanks. That's pretty awesome. But we're going to talk about winners. We're going so to ruin spoil. the video. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Not a single hot take in here. None. <laughs> Not None. at all. Every single one, perfect pick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Globally accepted. Are we allowed to... Universal. Um, are we allowed to kind of like say if we had different picks i was gonna yes yes you are okay, allowed yes. to have your own opinion okay. on the show that's, <laughs> despite <laughs> the google lawsuit said you couldn't but now you are allowed to i'm free <laughs> i'm free all right let's go down the list okay let's go down the list see if you guys agree if you wait have other is thoughts. the wikipedia oh, yeah. page like updated that. already probably oh, i haven't checked. definitely let me check whoever does this is incredible how quickly they have this there's a new category setup. yeah it's updated 2023 already. oh and the new category Maybe? too yeah. that's so cool all right so this is the spoiler this is the first year we have a new category so we have an extra trophy an extra award now to give out so we'll go through these and uh let us know your thoughts this uh, this is fun <laughs> i'm i'm actually excited to see if you guys have other thoughts because oh, let's chime in too if you have any all right oh yeah baby first best big phone i feel like this was the one um this wasn't necessarily a super easy one or hard one, but it's S23 Ultra for me. This is just a boring phone that does everything well at being big. Phones are like roughly all the same size as far as big phones now. Like 6.8 inches is like the size of a big phone. Mm -hmm. And this has an incredible screen. It has all of the cameras. It has two telephoto cameras. It has a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. It has multitasking features. It has a stylus built in. The stylus. That's what I was just looking up yes. again. Like, the stylus is dope. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I gave a runner up to the OnePlus Open and honorable mentions to the Find X6 Pro on the ROG Phone 7, but I yeah. do stand by S23 Ultra best big phone. Yep. I kind of agree with that. This one was a little bit difficult because it's like, how do you define big when you have folding phones that exist? I agree. I think this was a, an argument I used to make with best small phone because I thought the mm. flip in terms of like yeah. pocket size was small and okay, it packed a right big to punch. That. I, well, well, I don't want to cut do David want, off. I was yeah. cutting David off and okay. he had more I, I want to yeah. say something I really like about that Galaxy S23 Ultra that makes it feel like a truly like big phone is the bezels are insanely small on that phone. Yeah. Like you look at that screen and it's just like, you can barely see any bezel. It's like all it's screen. Good. Yeah. So it from screen to body ratio on that thing is crazy. And it, it's not even like curved over the sides or anything to try to make it seem even more screen than it actually is. So would you say yeah, I think it's a pretty Samsung's good the king at screen to body ratio? I there are probably they've been doing it for a long time. They always seem to have the high numbers. Yeah. Screen to body ratio companies from Vivo. in like China. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it feels the best i would okay, say yeah yeah and it's also like it's a 1440p like ltpo high brightness high accuracy like it's yeah. a great screen it feels boring to give it to samsung because one their products now come out in january so it's been so much time since it came out that's that also like, yeah, impressive uh -oh. though that they can pull off a win when they're yeah. arguably 10 months behind. one year old phone yeah one -year they're actually chip. a that's processor crazy. behind now yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're already yep. a processor behind. yeah i thought about giving it to the oneplus open which is an a phone we'll talk about later yeah but yeah find x6 pro is like it's it's really, really close good. it didn't just have it just didn't have the extra zoom 
ROG Phone 7 doesn't have wireless charging. Yeah. It does have much better speakers, though. So I was just kind of mm, like, yeah. yeah, this is the boring one. It just wins. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. All right. Best compact phone. Best small phone. This is a funny one, too, because phones have been stratifying. And all the small... Oh, <laughs> perfect. All the small I ones have that. gotten down to like a 6.1 inch screen. Like the smallest... Uh, like the Pixel 7a is 6.1 inch. The yeah. smallest S23, 6.1. Yeah. The smallest uh, iPhone, I believe, is 6.1, corner to corner. So they're all not that small. And uh, the Zenfone 10, which I'm giving like the clear head and shoulders win uh, for best small phone is 5.9. baby. It's actually Sorry. reachable. Yeah. And it has a ton of features. And it happens to also be an incredible phone. It's, it's like so a good. physics defying In every flagship, way. surprisingly good cameras. Really surprisingly good battery life. Yeah, like, like really very, good. very. The good battery performer. on this is wild. It's an excellent all around phone, and it happens to be the only reachable one. And it has something that the best big phone doesn't have, which is a headphone jack. It does. That <laughs> I still hilarious. think that's crazy. Five ninety nine. It's got an insanely fast processor. It's insanely good battery life. It's got wireless charging. They fix the back. It's on, I honestly think it's nearly flawless. That was my, yeah. And by yeah. the way, they're probably not going to make another small one. All the rumors are pointing to the really? thing Zenfone 11 Ultra. I'm really no nervous. Zenfone 11, so. My, I mean, I've been using it since it came out, so. So several months? Yeah, I love it. My biggest gripe, the ultra wide camera is not the best. Yeah, um, yeah it's soft. Which I've just like, been realizing more lately because mm. I'll be holding Lane in my arms and try and take a picture oh, and I'm like, oh, that's not that great <laughs> of a picture. Warped. But yeah, um, but no, I love it. I, I, yeah, I have like nothing bad to really yeah, say about it. it's so good. It's can, great. Can you show the MagSafe thing on the back of your it's phone? It's just like this MagSafe sticker. So you can buy these things now. I recommend yeah, this to everybody awesome. on their Android phone because then you can use MagSafe accessories. Mm -hmm. uh, it snaps on. Yeah. It just, it 3Ms on. Yeah. Um, the only my only gripe with it is it comes with this really great little thing that plugs into the USB C and then you has a guide to exactly where, oh. but it's only for like popular phones. Oh, so yeah. like you'll do it on like all the Samsung phones, you can line it up perfectly. I had to place it on a you know wireless a charger. MagSafe wireless charger and then like gently put the phone above it till it charged and then oh. like press down on the phone. Oh wow. But you know what you anyways. need? Magnet paper. Oh, true. But it would just look exactly like the sticker that's well, on it. Oh, exactly. Oh, exactly where oh. Where that would have been helpful. And then you could see exactly. It does where come the in a pack of two. Move it over. They're like eight bucks, also. Really? On Amazon, uh, I'll good. have. Yeah. Maybe we can put a link. In I the first saw this. Uh, Dan Seifert from The Verge added it to his Pixel Fold, and then yeah. now Alex has it on his Pixel Fold too. It's so. great. It's great. It's great. I gave an honorable mention for the best small phone to the Z Flip 5 for the reason you were talking about. It is able to fold down smaller and it has a tiny screen on the outside that is usable. Mm -hmm. So when you open it, it's still a 6.7 inch screen. It's a big phone again, but it has yeah. the ability to be small. So I gave it that. My mention. counter argument against that is that I really like the Razer more. Really? I think the Razer feels a little bit cheaper, but I think it has a lot more character. Samsung phones to me feel like they have zero character. So anymore. I agree. But it's again kind of in that boring light where like I think the Razer has worse cameras, worse yeah. battery, worse yep. software. Yep. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I like the software better and, on the Razer. And I don't know about software. I didn't use battery long enough to know if it's a worse battery life. But it's got a terrible camera. The Razer in low light is one of the worst cameras yeah. I've ever seen. So I gave I <laughs> so think bad. like as far as flipping phones, like Samsung leads the pack. And again, we're going to talk about foldables later. But like just build quality and just the ability to be the best and have all the features seemed like that was that's head and shoulders above the rest mm -hmm. like there's a couple folding up op flipping oppos and flipping yeah huawei's but this was this is the one yeah so that makes sense all right next category best camera iphone 15 pro it is the best overall camera in a smartphone for me and you're this is coming from a person who shoots a lot of videos on smartphones and takes a lot of photos and I think when you just look at photos, you can easily sway me off of this. Like there are others that take better photos. You could sway me to my honorable mention, which was the S23 Ultra with that 10X zoom, crushes the iPhone mm. zoom. Uh, 15 Pro Max even had a little bit of an extra zoom. But there are things that like, yeah, there are, there are others that do better low light that ha just have better photo features. Pixel, you could argue for all the AI features. But then video is a huge part of smartphone cameras too. And this always solidifies the iPhone for me because the video coming out of the iPhone is still so much better than all the rest. They yeah. added log this year. They yeah. added the ability to shoot to an external SSD this year. You can genuinely shoot 
excellent video on an iPhone yeah. in a massive variety of situations, which makes it the head and shoulders camera king for yeah. me. I think that all of the features they added for like log recording and all of the professional features, their USB-C recording to an uh, external hard drive, all this stuff, I think that definitely, definitely like makes it a lot better. I will say though that I think that the dual exposure pixel thing they added to the Pixel 8 Pro this year made the video capabilities way better. Yeah. You shot an autofocus episode on the Pixel 8 Pro. I did. And everyone was commenting like, this looks really freaking good. Loved the colors out of it. Mm -hmm. The stabilization was a little bit shifty okay. at times, mm -hmm. um, but it was very sharp and had awesome color and I loved that about it. Yeah. So, and, and the mics were pretty good too. I mean, I shoot more in, I need to shoot more in like less windy places <laughs> to like really get a good idea of the mics, but I was using the, the background wind Reduction. removal feature yeah. and it was pretty good. So yeah. it's good, right. it was good. But, it, and again, both of them need more manual controls. But if you ask me if I could only use one smartphone camera for the next couple of years, I'm doing iPhone 15 Pro. Yeah. Pixel 8 Pro did add all the manual controls for the photo mode, which was really dope. Love that. So, yeah. yeah. I do have a question here before you move on to honorable mentions. Um, and I saw it on Reddit. People are wondering, when you say iPhone 15 Pro, and now looking at some old things here, sometimes you said like the Pro and the Pro Max. In 2020, you only said Pro Max. Last yeah. couple of years, you've only said Pro. Are you kind of lumping them together? or Because there one, is a distinction this year. Yeah, there is. Yeah, Minimal, the but the telephoto. Three to five X lenses. That's it. Correct me if I'm the The log stuff wasn't. No, it's is on both. It's on okay. both, yeah. yeah. And this one, I'm lumping them together. The You're right. There is a different telephoto, and I think they both are the head and shoulders above the rest, so they okay. get lumped together in that way. Um, if there was a bigger difference between the two, I would pick the one that's better, which I think because of the extra zoom on the 5X on the Pro Max, you could argue that that's better. I think some people who just use 3X zoom would be totally you fine You could argue it. that's just preference at that point. Yeah, it's a small difference, rather, honestly. Yeah. Having shot with both, it's not a giant difference. Samsung has a 10X, like that's a big yeah. difference. Mm. These two, I'm just putting iPhone 15 and 15 Pro together at the top. Okay, so if anyone wondering, you're talking about both. Or 15 okay. Pro yes. and 15 Pro, Pro Max. Pro and Pro Max. So, yeah, sorry, yeah. Pro and Pro Max, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, I gave the honorable mention to S23 Ultra for the photo stuff. And if you want to know, the winners of the blind smartphone camera test after a few million votes. Yeah, let's talk about that. We've got them. So in standard mode, which was just a photo of me in front of the window in daylight, the winner for all of the masses was Pixel 7a. Let's go. <laughs> second <laughs> second place. Again, the phones right? always win. I love Didn't it. The A phone won last year too, yeah, right? Yeah, it did. It won last year as well. Yeah. yeah. The, the second place was the Pixel Fold, and the third place was the OnePlus Open. So am I, am I correct that the Pixel Fold has the same sensor as the Pixel 7a? I don't think so. I think they told no. me it was new sensors. It's new, but it's the same oh. size? Same Maybe. megapixel count? Okay. Same 50 megapixels. My theory, which has been true since the Pixel 6, in my opinion, <laughs> is that Google updated, they keep updating the sensor size, but the algorithm is still made Over. for the smaller sensors and they have not updated the algorithm. And so it's made for this small sensor world where you have to like do a bunch of noise reduction and all this other stuff. So that algorithm like isn't very necessary for the larger sensors now, which is why the smaller sensor pixels keep winning oh. because it works better on the, the smaller sensor pixels. Mm. Whereas the new ones, I've noticed that like, Pixels can overexpose really easily now, and like there's a lot of get a little HDR y. Yeah. Process. Yeah, a little overprocessed sometimes. They don't really know how to handle all the extra light you're getting from the bigger it, sensors. It got a little more interesting in the other categories as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was I was interested to see like Pixel one two. Yeah. Not eight pro though, just seven A and <laughs> Pixel Fold. <laughs> Which again, smaller sensors. Interesting. So then we got to low light, and the winner for the low light was iPhone 15 Pro. For the masses. That's kind of surprising. That made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, again, these are all full auto. Uh, the second place was Pixel 8 Pro, and the third place was Pixel 7a. Wow. Again. Pixel dominating. So Pixel showing up as 2.3, but iPhone 15 Pro having the best little light photo. It, these, for whatever reason, I mean, we took this on the roof with me in front of like the city background. I'm dimly lit. A lot of HDR going on. You mm. can see like a halo around the my halo. head in some of them. And they, they brightened me up, which was cool, but they looked a little weird. Mm -hmm. There was a Reddit actual. post that somebody, the haloing was so bad that somebody was like, what's happening? Did this yeah, get uh, messed up? It's like, no, some phones just are not great at doing <laughs> yeah, it. Man. Yeah, When I imported them, looking at them all side by side, I'm convinced like two of them darkened the sky and brightened my face to make it more like poppy. poppy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, it looked cool in the moment, but it was like that's not a natural looking photo. <laughs> yeah, that's not what I looked like in that moment. Wait, David, why did uh, why did iPhone surprise you for? 
Um, because the low light performance is like not generally something that Apple like hyper focuses on. But I think that their color in low light was better than almost everybody else. It had the most natural color. We only did three photos, so there's a ton of other variables that were not tested. I think if you had a moving subject, this would have been very different because some of them automatically did a long exposure for low light, some didn't. Mm. The iPhone, I think, did a two second exposure for this particular shot. Mm. Some of them were just like, bam, single shot, blast the HDR. It, and if you were like moving, that would work because I would be like frozen, but the iPhone would have me blurred. Right. So there's a bunch of variables that weren't tested here, but for this me sitting still outside in the dark, pretty good. Okay. Last one, portrait mode, which was just me, cut out from a background, normal looking shot. The winner was the Pixel 8 Pro. Dang. Second place was actually the Samsung Z Fold 5, interestingly. And third place was the iPhone 15 Pro. The, the portrait mode shots had the biggest variance between them all. Different focal lengths, different cutout strengths, different color characteristics, lots of stuff going on. Yeah. I think I also ended up with my winner being Pixel 8 Pro here. But yeah, Pixel podiumed on every single type of test. That's which crazy. Is interesting. You know what's wild is that we tested 20 different phones, tons of different manufacturers, mm -hmm. and the only three manufacturers that landed were Google, Apple, and Samsung. And the OnePlus Open grabbed oh, the one OnePlus Open right. <laughs> grabbed, a, grabbed a bronze medal in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's like watching the Olympics where they're like, dang, it's the same five countries. Well, the funny thing is like <laughs> the these are the three companies that everyone that like everyone says, like, oh, their cameras are not actually as good as they say they are. Actually, these or, other companies or, are better. Or, but then they win the blind test. This is as voted yeah. by you guys. Right. This is not me and my winners. This is I put them all up blind and you guys voted millions of times. And these are the ones that had the highest ELO ratings at the end for each category. I, I picked the Vivo for the, uh, the yeah, portrait my, mode. There's one. a lot of time. Oh, Vivo sneaks in there a lot. My I winners see. were a little different from this list. Yeah. Mine yeah. were really different from this list. I, have, I think my, my highest standard was the OnePlus 11. Oh. Weirdly. I had, a, I had the... Uh, um, it's a Fairphone 5. You did. Wow. I remember that. That was a surprising one, actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. Also, for anyone wondering why we didn't do a full video on this this year, it's just like camera improvements are pretty minimal every year. So like we found when we used to do the bracket style, the video each year kind of was very similar, but we still wanted to play the game because it's fun it's for fun. the audience. Yeah. So that's why this year the website was up. You just straight up got your results. There's no waiting till the end. And then we just tacked it into the smartphone awards. We do plan on doing a video either the next time we see a significant, big, interesting thing or probably like every couple of years where we feel like the camera improvements yeah. are getting exponentially bigger. Well, there's some big changes of yeah. big learnings, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Couple more. Big, uh, my, my value award. This was just a bloodbath. It could have been any one of like five phones. I ended up going with the one that again, almost feels like it's too easy of a pick. Mm. It's just the bland middle, everything you need, nothing you don't, A54. It's, I think it launched at 400 bucks. I think it's like close to 330, 320 bucks now. Samsung Galaxy A54 for those Samsung, that don't know. Sorry, mm -hmm. Samsung Galaxy yeah. A54. Yeah. Awesome 54, <laughs> is what they want to call it. Um, awesome magenta. <laughs> yeah. Literally, I, my analogy in the video was like, you know how someone asks you how your day is and you're like, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. How's the screen? It's fine. How's the cameras? How is fine. It's fine. Fingerprint reader? It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Battery life? It's fine. fine. It's the yeah. default skin of, yeah. uh, of yeah. like It's the generic phone yeah. that you get. <laughs> yeah. And it's fine because like that's all you need. Yeah. And it's everything you need. So it's it's totally reasonable pick for most people to just live with that phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I like it. I gave my runner up to the Moto G Play, which impressed me at $169. Crazy. And an honorable mention to the Pixel 7a, which is $500 now, but did actually get noticeable improvements and is a really good phone. Yeah. I think the Zenfone 10 is a great value. That's a very good point. Yeah, I do think yeah. value generally should stray less, but yeah. 600 bucks for a phone yeah. that I switch from like very good pixels and yeah. very happy with. That's a that's a great flagship point. specs too. Yeah, little but, stand over here. Yeah, but you could buy three Moto G plays. <laughs> I'd rather prices. have one Zenfone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that good. Like, yeah. The the G is impressive because you are getting like a pretty big screen. It's 90, 90 hertz, hertz and yeah. it's like very usable. Because when you test. I've tested some really cheap phones, and when you go down in price, they get slow, mm -hmm. and they get real bad software support. And that one was at least decent at everything, mm -hmm. so I was happy about that.
about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right. I, I don't know if I felt like there was like a cap to what I could give a value. No, for sure. To. I agree. I agree. Like I wanted, to, I don't know. Could I get well, we eight hundred dollars? We gave Pixel six and Pixel seven twice best value because those were this year it went up a hundred bucks on both yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. But previously those values were really good. They were up higher, but they were super super worth it. Yeah. For sure. Okay. <clears throat> best battery award: iPhone fifteen plus. Two day phone. There's not a lot of phones I can say that about. And it's a 60 hertz phone. And the other two phones that I mentioned, if you set them to 60 hertz, are also two day phones. Yeah. Which are the ROG Phone 7, which had a 6,000 milliamp hour battery, I believe. Mm, yeah. And the Zen Phone 10, which, if you set it to 60 hertz, is going to be a two day phone. Yeah. Um, ROG Phone 7 does not have wireless charging. No. Zen Phone 10 does not have particularly fast charging but it's still good i think it's 30 watts yeah it's decent yeah. um this is the largest battery ever in an iphone and i just couldn't kill it and i just i just had to give it the award it's that good yeah looking um, real quick looking at this list on wikipedia in 2014 your first year you did not do a best battery award i've never noticed that hmm. Hmm. you also didn't do best foldable that year that's true. weird that's weird, <laughs> weird. <laughs> but no no I, I like flip phone best battery feels like one actually funny enough the Categories have been exactly the same since 2014, except for that first year, no best battery, which seems kind of like yeah. And I changed the standard. design award. The design oh, award yeah, started yeah. off as like best build quality, and then yeah. it was, I, and then I just changed it to craziest design, and now it's just something design award related. Yeah, something mm-hmm. that was a little outside of the box, or which or we're about to get into, or noteworthy yeah. design. So let's do that one. Design award. This was actually it started off being the hardest one to give, and then it turned out being the easiest one because I can't. It's always like, I can't give this to like a, a plastic phone. I can't give this to a phone that doesn't have a headphone jack. I can't give this to a phone that doesn't have like flat s- display and like all the things that we need a phone to have. So it's end up, it's going to end up being the boring one. It's going to mm-hmm. end up being like the S23 Ultra or something. I'll argue a plastic phone that could have been mentioned. The Fairphone, yeah, I've got, right? I've got an argument Fairphone. for this one too. Because the Fairphone like design wise is designed to be replaced and stuff like that. I'm not saying it should have won, but that is a plastic one that does have a different design choice that, that is should fair. be applauded. Definitely a notable design. And in, in that particular way, it's it's interesting. I, it's still a thicker phone. It's still, is it water? I think it is water resistant, but it's still compromised a little bit. Okay. I'm but not I saying like it should have won. I'm I just like saying that. that like plastic shouldn't immediately, Fair. you can do good things with plastic. Fair. Plastic, revolutionary. I did plastic. disqualify plastic. <laughs> <laughs> but, What's uh, Ellis's? Crumple yeah. phone? Oh, best design award? No, it's 2021's iPhone 12 <laughs> mini, baby. Listen, okay, listen, 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 listen. Okay. I had to get the back glass repaired on this guy a little bit ago. And I went to the Apple store with my Apple Care, you know, um, and it took forever. It took like six hours for them to do this. And uh, so I finally came to pick up my phone. And naturally, I was like, what was going on, right? Uh, and the technician was like, I'm so excited that I get to sit down with you and talk to you about this. He said, first of all, you have, and this is a quote, the collector's iPhone. He described this as the best iPhone one could own. And he said specifically, it's because it is the strongest iPhone Apple has made since the X. That is the strongest? word from the technician. What he that said, well, I just like it's that he- so hard. Not only is it so hard to break these things, which I can attest to because I no case and I drop it every single day. But you did break it. I know you were at, you were at a repair that. appointment. That's <laughs> okay. what I was trying to like. That's so funny. But he was explaining that the railing and front glass of the 12 mini is so strong. It's almost impossible to, for even a technician to take them apart without completely breaking the entire You phone. know what's funny is that's why they changed the way that the iPhone 14 was made that to make it easier to take the back was, off because it was too hard to repair and it was costing them too much money. I think that was so this year. It, it was all 15? one piece. Anyway, this is all to say greatest iPhone ever made in my hands. I would argue that the 13 mini. mini is better because it has much better battery life. <laughs> well, if, if it's just the design award. But it doesn't come in purple. So. I have to disqualify them both because <laughs> they didn't come out this year. <laughs> yeah. Also, fact check, that was 2020, not yeah. 2021. Oh, either way. Yeah. This phone is pretty much brand new, so I think it's eligible. Mm. Ellis's iPhone 12. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Refurbished. <yeah. laughs> One best design. No, right. I, I gave it to the Honor Magic V2. Right. Because oh, I forgot we didn't even it get it. That phone was dope. Yeah, it was incredibly... It was just a physics-defying yeah. phone again. Yeah. 9.9 millimeters, 
biggest battery in a foldable. Just that by itself is like, wait, wait, hold on. 5,000 million hours. It's um, crazy. It has the full triple camera array. It has like all of the, the folding phone stuff, corner to corner outside screen, great aspect ratio. Really, really good design. Yeah. So yeah. shout out to them. Pretty and it's crazy. a folding phone, which yeah. is crazy because next category is the first ever best folding phone trophy bow, bow, bow. new new award for 2023 did, did you guys get tagged on twitter a bunch because apparently like six months ago we said yes. oh we're gonna do the new folding phone category yeah. when it happens say you can tell people you knew about this because of the podcast and i forgot <laughs> oh, we yeah. said that <laughs> and i just got a bunch of tweets yeah. like at me i was like yeah, I what, it, what said, happened we yeah. also said we'd pin the comment of whoever tweeted at us first oh oh so we need to good find... luck adam i did say, someone did say you know what to do and i was like i do not yeah. so we thank you find for... the first person that tweeted at, at us and we will uh we'll pin the comment for yeah, that. let me try episode. and find the first person who tweeted you got this you go through. <laughs> yeah yeah well it's the one plus open this year it's the best folding phone that came out this year. It's the most complete. It is yeah. a full flagship, a total banger. Like the screens are awesome, super bright, super responsive, super high-end specs, great battery, full-on cameras. You saw it get that bronze medal. It had really good cameras. Um, and the software was actually really good. A mm -hmm. little, little bit of interesting new multitasking features with the way they, they organize the, the different windows around, the panels. So yeah. if you made me pick a foldable to daily, that's the one I would pick. I would pick it by a slim margin personally over the Pixel Fold, which right. I gave my runner up because that, for whatever reason, well, I know why. It's because it's the aspect ratio and size, the passport stuff. It's awesome to use it closed. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. But it's a folding phone. So I got to open it sometimes. And yeah. it's not as good open. So that was my runner up. And uh, honorable mention to the Z Flip 5, both because it's the best flipping phone and also because it feels like Samsung's were the only ones that didn't have some sort of build issues, whether it's the screen or the hinge or something right. like that. Samsung's been at it the longest and they're doing the safest design, which is why they didn't win awards. Mm. But honorable mention for being durable. Yeah. I'll say the Pixel Fold's interior to screen is pretty bad. Yeah, the bezels are pretty big. It's um, just it it's just like dust. it doesn't look like it's kind of oily. It just doesn't look nearly as good as something like the OnePlus Open or the Honor Magic V2. The OnePlus Open has almost no crease, too. Yeah, it's very good. It's basically the same exact hardware as the Oppo Find like N3, N3 fold. fold or whatever it's yeah. called. But it, with, it is the exact same hardware. Yeah, yeah, same hardware. Yeah. It's good, man. I really wish that Oppo kept making the small passport foldables that they stopped with the Find N2 Fold. Oh, they stopped. Yeah. I didn't realize that. At least so far. Because they switched to a much bigger phone. Mm. That's part of the reason I really like the Pixel Fold is because it's Just shorter. That size, Small. Yeah. 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 So. Also alert slider. Didn't even mention that. Oh, right. All right. I also did a most improved award. I kind of like this one. Just like, what, let's acknowledge the biggest delta between last year and this year. And I ended up giving this one to the Nothing Phone 2. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the hardware is slightly improved and it has like a new curved back and better LEDs and more control over the glyph and stuff like that. But also a big software jump in the whole rewrite they did with Nothing OS, and now it's on Android 14 with Nothing OS 2.5, and it has a lot of character. And it's it has got, iMessage. And it's got the blue... Oh, wait. <laughs> uh oh No, no wait, sorry, no. Yeah. No, it doesn't. No. It, yeah. they, they don't have that anymore. Close. But the phone itself... <laughs> Deep cut. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would have locked them into the spot for sure if they'd gotten that through, but it doesn't have blue bubbles. But it is still really good. Uh, and I gave my runner-up to the iPhone 15 because they've had lightning for a decade. Mm. And it has USB-C <laughs> this year. Yeah. That's crazy. So there you go. That is a big improvement. Must improve. A lot of other phones are like almost the same as last year, basically. Yeah. And like Zen Phone 10, I'm glad it's almost the same as last year. I'm not mad. Yeah. I'm just saying. We it's got just reward. slightly better. Yeah. In every way. Um, bust of the year. The Solana Saga crypto phone. Now listen. <laughs> listen. I hear you. I'm not ignoring you. I hear you. There are a lot of people, mainly on Twitter, mainly with crypto in their bio, who have a lot of thoughts about how the resale price of this phone has gone up so much because you have to you got to spend like two grand to get one on eBay now. Did you know that? Yeah, they're like, like reselling five hundred dollars because all the bonk and <laughs> and all the. What is the crypto clanosaur? Clanosaur is that and you get? And the free honeybee toy or all whatever? This, no, of... no, no. It's called <laughs> Beemium. Get it right. All of the stuff Sorry. that you get with the phone at the moment is, is very valuable. Money. All, of the, all of the limited edition NFTs and stuff that you get with the phone are actually quite valuable at this point. So if you didn't valuable. buy the phone, you missed out on a bag. You could have sold it for $1,000 on eBay. Generational wealth. Here's the thing. That doesn't make it a good phone. 
Also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. Also, on top of that, we have always said that we judge these phones for this based on release msrp and things that happened at release right like yeah because there's a lot of times by the time we're into this people are like no the samsung phone's so much cheaper now the value should be this or my t-mobile gives me buy one get one free and those are great deals and bonk yeah. is cool that it's bonking off or whatever but like <laughs> it did not happen when the phone came out and when we first yeah. looked yeah. at the phone yeah. solana was and we don't get to if anything, did we shoot the smartphone awards already before yeah. this spike happened? We did actually. Yeah. 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 So the other thing is like, okay, this was uh it was a thousand dollars when it came out, whatever, then it was six hundred bucks when I reviewed it. But the the actual phone itself isn't good. So this was let's let's just say it's a normal six hundred dollar phone. It had a pretty solid build quality. This is a thing. This was made yeah. by the same team that made the Essential Phone 1, yeah. and it was made of ceramic, and it was heavy, and it had the colored buttons, and it had like a nice design. It was like a fair phone, but made of ceramic. It was cool. Yeah, true. Fingerprint reader on the back, that's a throwback. I liked it, it was mm -hmm. a throwback design. But then from that point on, you got a uh, worse SOC, you got a pretty bland uh, display, you got 4,100 milliamp hour battery, which in a phone this big is not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, cameras were not good, just straight up not good. Mm -hmm. And then the software is basically stock. They didn't add anything to the software experience other than the Solana features. The DAP store. The DAP store, exactly, <laughs> with the developers of the DAP store. So I will add this asterisk for you. If you are a really invested Solana holder, already or then even into crypto still, if no super, no but it's like not even no, in crypto you have crypto. to be like into oh, the solana okay. chain and then, yeah yeah the thing about the da app store too is that you can't only use the da apps on the solana you sound like saga. you're hiccuping <laughs> while saying app store <laughs> it's not like you can only use the da apps on the solana saga you can use them on any android phone it's just a curated list of apps i mean you get the seed vault there were a couple things that were built into the phone that yeah. were unique the seed which, vault is cool which is why i will say if you are like all in to that ecosystem, right. then that feature may push it over the edge for you to want to still spend $600 or I guess go to eBay now and spend $2,000 on a phone with a subpar display, subpar battery life, subpar cameras and subpar software mm -hmm. because you have that feature working for you. In which case, the runner up is the bust of the year, which is all of the concept phones that didn't come out this year. You know who you are. The Solana phone came with a really cool USB cable that had a little switch that allowed you to do only charging or charging plus data. I still use that cable. And they were selling it on Amazon for like $30, but I can't find it now. Oh, so, oh, so that makes it a good... Just kidding. <laughs> MVP. <laughs> yeah, okay. MVP. Also, yeah. if you thought Marquez, who doesn't talk about crypto at all, was going to think this was like the greatest phone ever. For someone who doesn't use crypto, I just don't know what yeah. to say. I tried to give it a chance. I tried to like actually review it as a person who didn't have to spend the money. I bought the phone. No, I didn't. I got the phone sent to me and then I gave it a chance, which I didn't have to. <laughs> and I really like started to use the phone for a while. Uh, so that is, my, that is my L of the year. Uh, and now we get to the W of the year, which is the phone of the year, the MVP, I, it, there's a bunch of ways to, to find this one. I could just say it's my favorite phone of the year, the mm -hmm. most impactful, the most well-rounded, whatever. But my phone of the year is the Pixel 8, Google Pixel 8. And it's just, it's a, it's a nice graduation to finally, like I think starting to hit the stride of what they intended when they started making Pixel, which it took a couple years. We're on Tensor yeah. G3 now. We're on like this new third generation of of this this thing that they started doing. But... Awesome screen, much brighter, 120 hertz, LTPO. Well, for Pro. No, the Pixel 8 as well. Really? 120 hertz, yeah. It's not quite as bright, but it's still 2,000 plus nits. It's an awesome screen. It's a really, really good camera, as we already know. Tons and tons of clever software features. The only thing I don't like about it is the artificial gating of features from the Pro phone. Right. Which is almost like not its fault. Like if that Pro phone didn't exist, then all these features would be on this phone too. <laughs> but honestly, seven years of software updates kind of sealed it in for me. I yeah. think that's an awesome promise. And if they deliver, I have no regrets about this being phone of the year. There were some gates that were a little bit more legitimate. Like I did a lot of research into how video boost works and you actually do need a lot of RAM to make that work. Okay. So I think the 12 gigs of RAM versus the eight actually did help it. Um, but I think that a lot of the features were artificially gated. So 100%. yeah, but seven yeah. years of software updates is That's crazy. crazy. Yeah. That's I did crazy. have some, uh, a runner up, which is the Zenfone 10. Yeah. The nearly flawless 
Zenfone. I think 10. that's my phone of the year. Is the Zenfone it's 10? Really, good. personally, it's really good. Yeah, I kind and of. And it. It, it's it's missing a few software features for me, which I I still keep coming back to the Pixel Four. Yeah. And then honorable mentions to the iPhone 15 Pro, which is just a rock solid phone that finally has USB Type C. Hmm. The S23 Ultra being the boring one generation of chip old flagship that's still incredibly good, and the OnePlus Open best yeah. foldable of the year. So that's my smartphone awards. And the Solana phone. And the, yeah, <laughs> not a single hot take in here. I like I like the awards. If you guys want to watch the full video and all the breakdowns, and even though you already know the winners, you can still sort of enjoy the lead up and the descriptions of each phone. You can watch the smartphone awards. We'll link it below. Mm -hmm. But you know what we should insert right now? Trivia! I just want to say, if this is not cheese trivia based on Marquez's cheese answer before, I'm going to be a little upset. Monterey. Jack, it, it better be in what state? A Gouda question. Oh, it is. All right. Activity Pub, everyone's favorite decentralized social media network protocol. Blue Sky would like a word. The app protocol. But anyway, continue. Oh, right. Because they don't use. They don't use it. Activity they have their Pub. own at protocol. But anyway, continue. Mm, I wonder how that's going. But go on. Go on. It's actually an iteration on an earlier protocol with a very similar name. Was that similar name A, Activity Pup, B, Activity Pump, C, Shacktivity Pub, <laughs> or D, Activity Plum? Is Shacktivity like Shack the basketball Like Shaquille O'Neal, yeah, okay, yeah. Shaq I have explanations for all these. I figure we'll save them for okay, the cool. end. Okay, cool. Okay. I have my own explanation for the first one already. For Activity Pup, is it about Dogecoin? Because if no, so, about, you'd be right. It's about Woof. Oh, like the farm thing? No, like the wow. fake app in the office where you uh, send a wolf and it sends like to every single device that you have. No, unfortunately, it's about Dogecoin. Okay. But we'll get to that after, after the, break. the break. After the break. Bye. Are Bonk and Dogecoin connected? No. Uh, no. Support for this episode of Waveform comes from Shopify. Life is complicated, whether you're trying to renew your driver's license or figure out that expired sour cream in the back of your fridge, is it still good or not? I don't know. Every day offers new challenges that are more annoying than they should be. If you're running your own business, you know how tiring it is to deal with all those little snags. Shopify offers a cleaner, simpler path forward. Shopify can help your business succeed at every single stage of the journey. So whether you're launching your online shop or opening that first brick and mortar location or expanding to new markets all over the country, Shopify's all-in-one platform has you covered wherever and whatever you're selling. Collect payments in person and online, track business critical data and use AI generated insights to make your operation even more efficient. Shopify is the engine powering more than 10% of all e-commerce in the US, including major brands like Allbirds and Brooklinen. So see what their all-in-one platform can do for your business today. So sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash waveform. So go to shopify.com slash waveform now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash waveform. Support for Waveform comes from Babbel. So we spend our earliest life stages doing astounding things, developing object permanence, learning a language, eating spaghetti with your hands. Incredibly, you can keep doing one of those things well into adulthood, and you won't need a bit for it. With Babbel, it's never too late to start learning a new language. Instead of paying $100 for a private tutor, Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. Their tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full college semester. So here's a special limited time deal for our listeners to get you started right now. Get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash waveform. That's 55% off babbel.com slash waveform. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash waveform. Rules and restrictions may apply. All right, welcome back to the final section of Waveform. We got a couple quick car stories because cars are tech and there's some pretty good stories. First of all, Tesla says they are testing a wireless charging mat for your car. I don't believe you. Just kidding. I believe you. I just don't think this is shipping anytime soon. So basically what happened is Franz, the, de the designer at Tesla, head designer, went on the Jay Leno show showing him the Cybertruck. And at some point, I think Jay Leno asked him about wireless charging. And Franz said, oh, yeah, we're working on that. We're working on that. Yeah, you just drive your car over like a mat in your driveway and then don't even have to plug anything in. It'll charge your car. 
I believe that you're working on it, just like you're working on the Roadster, which just means it's not likely to come out anytime soon. Here's why. <laughs> Wireless charging is not efficient. <laughs> and no matter how much you work on the tech, obviously there are some physics limitations. The one other car, this should answer any questions you might have about how soon it could come out. The one other car that has actually tried and shipped this exact feature is the three and a half million dollar McLaren Speedtail. The McLaren mm -hmm. Speedtail is not an electric car. The McLaren Speedtail has a wireless charging puck that you can drive over or like slide underneath the car. That is basically a slow charging, like trickle charge tender for the battery in that gas car, like the little car battery in there. Yeah. Because this is a car that's basically, let's be honest, sitting in mostly garages and not being driven much. And people who own three and a half million dollar cars like that have a ton of other cars that they drive a lot. And so this is a car that's just gonna sit in your driveway. So a lot of these cars come with slow trickle chargers and they thought, oh, this is a small enough battery that even if you get it slightly off center or don't drive quite to the center, this is a good trickle charger. Do you know why that also makes sense? Because how expensive is that car? Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. But then you don't have to have like the wire rubbing up on it all the time when you have to keep it plugged in in the garage. Yeah. Now it's just yeah. free. But yeah, the thing about wireless chargers is, and you you can observe this with any phone, we love the MagSafe because it snaps it into place to get the exact alignment for ideal charging efficiency. Yeah. But if you're driving your car onto it, you could be to the left a little, to the right a little, you could go too far forward, you could go not enough forward, you could have your suspension too high, something. It just might not be in the exact ideal position. And so you could draw hundreds of extra watts of power from your wall that don't go into the car. Yeah. If you're just not quite on the right spot. Also, that supercar that you were talking about, uh, it's very low to the ground, which means it's going to be a, a lot yeah. closer contact to the inductive charger. And then, I mean, maybe the Roadster could do this if it's close enough to the ground. But most of Tesla's cars are at least raised a little bit. So you're going to lose more energy if you it's have tough. it too It's far. a cool idea. I yeah. love the like futurism of thinking about it. But with today's tech, it's an insane idea. Yeah. It's, That's all. Like yeah. the biggest gripe about electric cars is how long it takes to charge in the most, like at the absolute best charging rate right now, plugged in at a Tesla supercharger is still takes a long time comparison to gas cars. So now, before we've even really gotten that to like the best of its capabilities, I mean, or, at least or this like, is home charging, right? Yeah. True, but even home charging, if you're using, how long does it take to go about full Out of on a outlet? 240 volt? A two, a uh, like hours. an upgraded outlet. Let's uh, give it the like. Yeah, yeah, I have a 240. It charges at 11 kilowatts, so a couple hours overnight after a daily commute, and you're fine. It okay. charges about 30 miles an hour in my battery pack. So that's plugged in at 11 kilowatts. Yeah. If I, I don't know the exact percentage efficiency. I'm not even going to try to guess it. 10 miles an hour but on a wireless. That's that, probably. That would be pretty good. Okay. But you're still going to pull the full power from your wall. Right. You're just losing you're a, lot wasting a lot of yeah, energy. Yeah, you're just wasting energy. So yeah. that's that's tough. And like the grid can't really do that. They're definitely working on this. They they purchased this German wireless car charging company, Wifurion, in July. Yeah. Strange name. Dude, super weird name. Super Wifurion. weird name. Wifurion. It sounds like. Like an, uh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they sold the company, but they ended up keeping the engineers. So they obviously are working on the technology. They probably just want a proprietary version. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, I would love to see what they end up with, but I, I don't doubt if it's going to take quite a while. I'd bet anything the Roadster comes out before this. <laughs> Yeah. Literally. Wait, so yeah, talk about your bet with Sawyer Merritt on Twitter. I just bet him that exact bet. Oh, okay. He said, uh, this is, why, like, why do you not think it's coming out? I'm like, this is so far from today's tech. So anyway. He said, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a stupid thing to say online. Like, why do you yeah. think this isn't coming out? No, I just don't think it's coming out any f time soon. Yeah, it's going to be a long time. You know what would be pretty cool? If your Tesla had, like, brushes that could come out from the bottom or the top and make contact with electrical wires... So that you could charge while you drive. You're talking about a bus. And then, train. yeah, then you could make the Tesla big enough for you and all your friends. And then it comes at a pre-planned time and route so you can drink. Nice. Oh, so self-driving. A bus. Self-driving. A bus. Okay. Wait, what? Here's a question. What do you think comes first? Uh-huh. Good wireless charging pad. Public infrastructure. That can, no, no, that can fit in your garage or... A Tesla bot that can just plug your car in for you. <laughs> well, remember the early stages where they were testing that um, the, the snake the, the arm, snake arm that would like look for the and then Simone and plug itself in. Simone built one, didn't she? She did. Yeah. She really. That's another thing where I feel like there were too many variables. 
plugging it by itself. Yeah, the snake arm to plug into the, your car. Because I'm saying Tesla bot. People are lazy. Tesla, man. Tesla bot can definitely deadlift <laughs> so uh, wire. Which one do you think wire. will ship to real people first? Yeah. I think Tesla would ship the wireless car charger before Tesla bot. Is but that... that's a whole nother take. It's just a whole nother <laughs> thing. A whole nother take. I mean, Tesla bot's supposed to do mundane things at your home that you don't want to do. So it can just meet me in the garage and plug my car in while I walk inside and <laughs> slam the door in its face. <laughs> and then it can break down all my cardboard boxes that you I throw in the garage. You can't be mean to Tesla bot. <laughs> Everyone knows how that movie goes, Andrew. You can't oh, be mean man. to it. Wait, is this is the snake? Is that real? The yeah. snake charger? Yeah, no, yeah. It's I don't not. think it ever happened. It's not a real they, they was was, It was like a marketing. It was a marketing demo from 10 years ago. Just like driving across the country was a yeah. marketing demo from 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, okay. Cool. It's crazy. Wait, Let's see your bus of that. It's yeah. just like crazy that like they're like, you know, Tesla, I think it's obvious. We have a little bit of a PR problem. People assume we don't have morally the right ideas. Let's have our charger embody the, the metaphor from the Bible for evil, <laughs> a serpent. It's like, who? Oh, never mind. Continue. There's... All right. Well, we can move on a couple other quick things. Uh, I think the last big domino has fallen with this NACS thing. The Volkswagen Group has finally committed to NACS in 2025. Volkswagen Group, meaning that includes Audi and Porsche. So, you know, Taycan, e-tron, all of those EVs. At this point, I feel like it's safe to say everyone who currently ships a battery-powered EV has committed to NACS. All the dominoes have fallen. There's definitely one. And I can't wait to read the comment on There's the one we're be a missing. Comment, and it's pr- if you say it's the Ram pickup truck, that doesn't ship for another year. We did and a discuss half. this. Yeah. If it's something else I'm missing, feel free to let me know. But Lucid was like the second to last domino. This is like, all right, Porsche, Audi, VW Group is in. All right, the big dominoes are all in. And ACS is now the new North American charging standard, period. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. to, to add on to that, the Society of Automotive Engineers actually officially announced NACS as a standard very recently last week, which we kind of missed last week um, after Tesla released the specifications in 2022. That is a big deal because now the government is reassessing how they're going to allocate their $7.5 billion EV fund, which previously allowed NACS chargers, but it had to also have the magic dock that allowed CCS yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Now, you don't... Tesla just did all this engineering to make the magic dock and now they kind of don't need to make it anymore considering all cars are switching by 2025. Yeah, and the original thing was because to get the government subsidy, it had to be able to charge more than one type of car. Yeah, Yeah. car. And who knows if that helps start this, but also like Tesla doing this, I'm sure licensing it all out is probably making a boatload of money. Well, now that it's a standard, I don't know if they are licensing it out because they opened, they... uh, they released the specifications in November 22. Yeah. I think at this point, they don't care about licensing the port. They have the most um, network oil uh, gas stations. They have the most gas stations, right? And if you use like the Tesla app and whatever mm-hmm. at the gas station, that means that they're going to make the most money. Like they've, they've kind of saturated the market in a lot of ways. And now they're just like, we already have the biggest network. Let's just make money as the, as the gas station. Yeah. So, and they're still building more. Yeah. One last headline. Uh, Mercedes. I thought this was actually pretty clever. I don't know why really? I like it so much. I kind of like it. Okay. Mercedes is adding, if I got approval to add a special new colored light to the car that indicates when that car is currently self-driving. It's a turquoise colored light. So there's all these rules. I don't know exactly what uh, countries this is going to be allowed in, but basically you can only have certain like amber or red colored lights or white colored headlights on your car. This is a new color they've gotten approval to add just for when the car is driving itself. I kind of like it. I kind of want to know. Why? When someone else is. I want to know when the car is driving itself. And I don't know why. (laughs) I don't actually. (laughs) I think I, you know know why. why. You want to stay in an extra lane away from it. Mm, No, I want to just blow right past it and not even think about it like i think the the human driver is actually more likely to make a weird erratic to be aggressive yeah 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 so if if a car is like stopped at like a stop sign for way too long i'm not going to beep because it's self-driving i'll just drive around because the car is clearly (laughs) doing something dumb and i'm just going to drive around it it's just nice to know when it's messing up due to being self-driving you know however mercedes does have a very good level Four? Is it level four self-driving? They have pretty decent self-driving. I've tested. Yeah. I actually, it was years ago that I tested it, so I, I don't, I haven't used it. Lately. A lot of people have said recently that the Mercedes one is very good. They do, which yeah. is surprising. I would like to try that. So there's going to be cars out there 
self-driving all the time. When I see this, I feel like it semi reminds me of stickers that say like student driver at baby which then board. it makes yeah well, well if it's like the baby on board one it's like i wasn't gonna crash into you anyways but i'll be extra <laughs> yeah. careful around yeah. your student baby. driver though yeah the you student see. driver one might actually prompt people to like i've seen have you ever seen where it's like a student driver parked at a red light and they're just ready for the horn and the millisecond <laughs> it hits green they just lay the horn on and like yep. oh man it, people so and don't ever do this this is extremely dangerous but people mess with student drivers and That's i'm awful. very scared of people messing with self-driving cars and accidentally yeah. committing vehicular manslaughter driving and, by the mercedes with the blue light on it throwing your coke <laughs> at the cameras <laughs> it's very scary don't do that do not do don't any do of this that. but yeah i'm <laughs> but maybe do it a little no i know there's a lot of people who mess with evs don't and i don't do think that. i want to see people messing with well the evs that are self-driving self and that are obvious now they're like super there'd be like a waymo with like yeah. 12 yeah. sensors on it so like yeah people throw stuff on people literally put cones, cones. on the nose of the car just yeah. to troll it and it yeah. stops the car in its tracks like that's already a thing that happens so this isn't going to change that it's just this is an extra layer of you're in a neighborhood and you're about to cross the street and you look to your left and you see a car coming and it's got the, the blue light on. Maybe I'll wait an extra second for that yeah. one. And most you know? people will not know what it means. Just, I would say just in case. Pro tip, always wait the extra second when there's a car involved. Well, if you see a person in the front seat going like this. Oh, fair, fair, driving. fair, fair. But if you see a person who looks like they're looking at you, but they're clearly not controlling the car, it's good to know that they're not controlling the car. Or they're asleep. Yeah. So that's all. That's yeah. a, that's a headline I thought was interesting. I like being Fun. overly cautious. Have you ever seen like a car coming and it's going to make a turn where you are and it's blinkers on? I always wait to make sure they make the turn because the chances that that person might just have a blinker on and blow uh, past the uh, turn or decide, oh, wait, I'm not turning here. And then you start yeah. making. Yeah. Jersey, Be we careful. have the opposite problem usually. There's no blinkers in Jersey. Exactly. By law. They just make the turn. <laughs> they don't ever indicate. And it has to be <laughs> over two lanes every time. I was do. behind a person on the highway <laughs> today on the way to the studio who drove. She drove in the left lane with her right blinker on for over a mile. And then when she finally changed lanes, she put her left blinker on to turn into the right lane. Her controls are inverted. <laughs> and then I passed <laughs> she her forgot. And she was on her phone. <laughs> oh. Australia. Yeah. It was unbelievable. I, I was just. That's New Jersey for you. I, I lived in Philadelphia for uh, many years, which is on the southern border of New Jersey, for those unfamiliar <laughs> to geography. And in Philly, West. we refer to something as Born the Irish. Jersey slide. Because when you have to drive into Jersey to do something, a Jersey slide is when someone merges three or more lanes at once <laughs> without their signal. Yeah. Nice. Because I, I need to be in the fast lane until the exit. No, 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 it's no, the it's, opposite. It's always people going from, from the, the fast ex. lane going, there's my exit. Yeah, yeah that's Yo! what I mean. I want to be in the fast lane. I'm not going to lose time on oh this. My God. All right, enough <laughs> Jersey talks, guys. We went, that I was a, this is in our bio. That was a stagger of like Jersey good talk. car tips and bad car tips and yeah. pick the good ones. All right. Anyway, let's do trivia. Let's do trivia. It's been a long episode. Oh, yeah. Do, 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 do. Welcome back to Trivia, everybody. We've got two banger questions today, if I do say so myself. Question number one. As part of all The Verge's awesome coverage of this Google lawsuit, Chaim Gartenberg covered a secret Google program intended to butter up and keep developers in the Play Store. What was this program called? By the way, Chaim is at Google now, which is ironic. <laughs> It's funny, you report on Google and they're like, did I read an old article and not? Yeah, he probably, he yeah, probably was. This is from 2021. Yeah, he's probably covering it in 2021. Can you read it one more time? I forgot the question. Oh, you know what? This is actually, this is part of the Epic lawsuit. No, this is the same lawsuit. I forgot the, I don't. <laughs> it's part of the Epic lawsuit. lawsuit. We, yeah. Okay, it's, I was it's right. It's all Play Store. Sorry, so wait, sorry, I got. Oh, no, it sounds that's, like your pencil's that's down. I, no, come on. <laughs> don't know the question. I, the question? We, were, we were yelling at each other. What's the yeah, question? okay. That okay. is going to stay in the episode because that is useful context. Yeah. I uh, should have looked at the date when I was writing this trivia question. I'm a great, I, a great person, by the way. Yeah. What's the question? Uh, okay, Google had a secret program, and the goal of this program was to keep developers using the Play Store instead of letting them pull an epic. So okay. what was this program called? Marquez, I'm giving you... Till right now. Now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> I'm wrong anyway. It doesn't matter. I know. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's flip them and read. Anyone? Project <laughs> Hug. So I, right. I said Project Hug. Which is the correct answer. Which is correct. 
I said Operation Grilled Cheese. No, but that's pretty. That's pretty it good. Buttered up. Oh. Oh, mine doesn't even make that much sense. Wait, uh, mine, it's probably less. Operation lame, but... Sweet Tooth. I like that too. Bad. That's a good answer. We All of those treats. Those could be real Google programs too. But yes, Project Hug was what it was referred to around the house. I believe the official name was the Apps and Games Velocity Program. Hmm. Wow. Yes. Very stealthy. Question two about Activity Pub, <clears throat> everyone's favorite decentralized social networking protocol, except Blue Sky, apparently. It's actually an iteration on an earlier protocol with a very similar name. Is it A, Activity Pub, a decentralized proof of stake protocol that mined the cryptocurrency meme coin, Dogecoin? B, Activity Pump, a reference to a decentralized protocol being an activity pump, which feeds an activity stream. C, Shacktivity Pump, excuse me, Shacktivity Pub, an early investment venture of Shaquille O'Neal started off the hot 2010s hype of Facebook. Or D, Activity Plum, a full social network pat platform which used purple as a visual distinction from its main competitor, Twitter. Do we need time to think about this? I feel like you have I think lots we of all time. wrote our answer. Right, yeah. We yeah, all ready? I did. Are we all confident? Oh, wait, no, I need to add another. <laughs> Bartez is taking an artistic license. I did some art on mine. All right, well... Uh, why don't we flip and read then? Who wants to go first? Uh, we all said something different. Okay. No, I did the same as you. I, no. Okay. No. Uh, yep. Okay. I said. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. For those, Marquez wrote the letter B, but it's a dog which wolfing would, the letter B, which, which be is A, a activity yeah. pump. Right, but I wrote B. Okay, I also wrote B, activity pump. Yes. Activity I'm so pump. good at being wrong. It's like when the... you write brown, but you write it in yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or shake your head yes and it's say like no. <laughs> yesterday, spelled it S-I-E or something. I did plump. I like that. Uh, alas, that would have been cute, but no, it was activity pump. Uh, from pump.io. I wrote, yeah. I did a guy pumping his hand. Oh. Uh, a lot of fingers. <laughs> That's five. <laughs> it's it's just AI five. Hand. So that brings our scores to Marquez with 19 points. David also with 19 points. Oh, here we go again. And, and Andrew also, also with one, <laughs> two, he was gone for parental leave. Give him a break. <laughs> Give him a break. Nine. Oh, sorry. I read that wrong. Thirteen. You carried too many ones. Points. You carried <laughs> six extra ones specifically. Isn't this what happened last season? Is that Marquez and I were tied, and then I just totally yeah. got destroyed. The points mean nothing. Or maybe I was yeah. above. The final score was like four hundred points. Yeah, I think. No. <laughs> yeah. It's all about multiplication, baby. Yeah. Well, that's been it. Thanks for listening with us. Thanks for uh, tuning in, and uh, I hope you have a happy holidays. We got more stuff coming for you, but obviously, it's uh, it's all holiday themed and related, or actually, end of the year themed and related. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned for that. Until the next one, catch you later. Peace. Waveform was produced by Adam Molina and Ellis Roven. We're partnered with the Vox Media Podcast Network, and our intro outro music was created by Vane Sill. Yo, I. <laughs> Where are we going with this? <laughs> I had my music on shuffle yesterday. Uh oh. And Hey Ya from Outcast came up. Uh huh. And that's the first time I really listened to the lyrics of this song. It's and depressing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I don't yeah, think yeah. I know though. The song is sad. <laughs>